Welcome to this uh, webinar organized by the Ontologies Community of Practice of the CGAR Platform for Big Data and Agriculture. I'm Celine Aubert, the Communication Coordinator of the COP, and I will um, facilitate the, the webinar today. So today, Dr. Stephanie Russo-Carroll and Talia Anderson from the University of Arizona will talk about the care principle of indigenous data governance. This topic is a bit beyond the scope of the COP, but we thought it would be good to, uh, to raise awareness among our community about these principles, given that much of the data we collect comes from indigenous people. Dr. Carroll is Assistant Professor of Public Health and Associate Director for the Native Nation Institute at the University of Arizona. Her interdisciplinary research group, the Collaboratory for Indigenous Data Governance, develops research, policy, and practice innovations for indigenous data sovereignty. Stephanie co-edited the book Indigenous Data Sovereignty and Policy and led the publication of the Care Principle for Indigenous Data Governance. Talia Anderson is a PhD student at the University of Arizona. A PhD research focuses on changes in extreme events and rainfall in Central America and will explore if and how climate information is used by farmers in Guatemala. As part of a case study, she is currently working with Stephanie to evaluate CGR's practices and policies as they relate to indigenous re research and ethics. So uh, now it's time for, for the presentation. Welcome everybody to Transforming Big Data for Indigenous Futures, the Care Principles for Indigenous Data Governance. Siduk Atnakastan, Siduk Stephanie Carroll, Tishu Stas, Landak Alchina. Hello, I'm Stephanie Carroll. I'm Atna from the native village of Kulika along the Copper River in Alaska, and I'm of Sicilian descent, and I'm coming to you from the University of Arizona. Um, and I'm Talia Anderson. I'm a PhD student in the School of Geography, Development and Environment, also coming to you from the University of Arizona. We respectfully acknowledge that the University of Arizona is on the land and territories of indigenous peoples. Today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes with Tucson, where we're sitting, being home to the Otham and the Yaqui. Committed to diversity and inclusion, the university strives to build sustainable relationships with sovereign native nations and indigenous communities through education off offerings, partnerships, and community service. First, we wanted to share with you the lab that we run out of the University of Arizona, this interdisciplinary research group called the Collaboratory for Indigenous Data Governance. Uh, builds upon and supports the movement to develop new institutional frameworks that center the terms of Indigenous communities around research and data partnerships. Our collaboratory team members engage tribal rights holders and institutional stakeholders through research, education, and advocacy to understand the barriers that they face and to identify opportunities for change. Our overall goal is to move beyond mere recognition of Indigenous peoples' rights to data towards institutional policy and practice changes that protect and strengthen Indigenous peoples' relationships with their data, information, and knowledge. Our presentation today respectfully acknowledges the contributions of collaboratory members, as well as through teaching efforts such as Talia's participation. Indigenous peoples span the globe comprising over 370 million people worldwide who belong to over 5,000 cultures across 70 countries. This is a gross underestimation. Um, it is thought that there's over 500 million indigenous peoples, for instance, in Asia alone. Indigenous peoples have inherent sovereignty to govern their people's lands and resources. Indigenous peoples, nations, and communities have historical continuity with pre-colonial societies. They endeavor to preserve, develop, and transmit to future generations their ancestral territories and lifeways as the basis of their continued existence as peoples in accordance with their own cultural, social, and legal institutions. A quick tour of the key points of positioning statements for our presentation today. First, sovereignty matters and is central to research relationships. Second, Data are our relations. When we forget that, we forget the responsibilities we hold to the information and the people to which it relates. Data are critical to the exercise of tribal sovereignty. Only indigenous peoples and nations can exercise indigenous data sovereignty as the rights holders. Indigenous organizations, other governments, institutions, corporations may generate and hold an ind indigenous data and have responsibilities. Enacting Indigenous data sovereignty includes both data for governance and the governance of data 
Tribally driven data work requires relationships with other data actors and experts for both stewardship and expertise. And finally, assertions of indigenous data sovereignty spur innovation and design and data and research policy and practice. We'll begin with just a quick tour of indigenous research and data to ground some of our contextual um, concepts and recommendations that we make in our work. First, indigenous knowledge systems are informed by the longitudinal inquiry lasting generations. Indigenous communities form, test, adapt, and refine their knowledge systems based upon careful observations, interactions, and longevity in place. Many indigenous cultures utilize a variety of oral and physical mechanisms for transmitting knowledge and information. So here we see different tools for storing and conveying information and data that come from North America, for instance. So starting from the left clockwise, a totem pole, the Lakota winter count, an autumn calendar stick, and a wampum belt. However, by and large, the settler colonial experience has been comprised of various efforts to kill, suppress, or co-opt indigenous knowledge systems and these methods of storing and transmitting uh, data and information. Today, indigenous people's data include data generated by indigenous peoples, as well as by governments, private sector, and other institutions on and about indigenous peoples and territories. Indigenous peoples data comprise information and knowledge in any format about the environment, lands, skies, resources, and non-humans with which they have relations. Information about indigenous individuals, such as administrative, census, health, social, commercial, and corporate data, and information and knowledge about indigenous peoples as collectives, including traditional and cultural information, oral histories, ancestral and clan knowledge, cultural sites, stories, and belongings. Importantly, indigenous relationships with researchers have often been fraught. As part of her dissertation research, collaboratory member, Dr. Dominique David Chavez developed the scale of levels of indigenous community engagement in research as one of the many ways to assess how researchers access indigenous knowledge systems and how they engage with community members who maintain them. It is adapted from a participatory agriculture research and is based on who holds authority and governance in the research process, ranging on the left from no engagement up through indigenous led research. Findings from a global systematic review analyzing 20 years of climate studies that were including indigenous knowledge in the research found that 87% of these studies were extractive, representing colonial legacies and sitting on the left side of these relationships. Yet there are a handful of studies as well as numerous grassroots community efforts that live on the self-determined self end of the scale. How can we grow this end? And what are institutional responsibilities and practices that can bolster relationships so, so that we have science and service to indigenous communities? The questions then become, what are indigenous people's expectations? Indigenous data sovereignty is the right of indigenous peoples to govern their data from collection and storage to use and reuse. Finding its foundations and in inherent sovereignty, only indigenous peoples and nations as rights holders can exercise indigenous data sovereignty. Indigenous data sovereignty is a responsibility and expression of the ways, traditions, and roles that communities have for the care and use of their knowledge. Using a human rights framework, indigenous data sovereignty leverages tools such as laws, policies, and agreements, including the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, nation state recognition of indigenous peoples, treaties, and other mechanisms. Indigenous data sovereignty underscores that knowledge belongs to the collective and is fundamental to who we are as indigenous peoples. Data are critical to the exercise of tribal sovereignty and indigenous peoples require data for governance and self-determined decision-making. When activating indigenous data sovereignty, native nations and other data agents replace external non-tribal norms and priorities with tribal systems that define data, control how it's collected and influence how it's used. It results in findings derived both from external data collected on indigenous peoples and from internal data produced by native nations that reflect the understandings of those peoples. At the same time, indigenous nations, like many other governments and institutions, create and enact data policies and practices that align with their values and knowledge system. These activities of indigenous data governance are a means of implementing greater indigenous data sovereignty. 
for the past five years, there have been a plethora of scholarship, including um, the foundational book, Indigenous State of Sovereignty, and the follow-up book on Indigenous State of Sovereignty and Policy, as well as frameworks and principles for Indigenous state of governance at various levels, from the very high-level care principles for um, Indigenous state of governance to nation state or um, collective-based principles, such as uh, the principles of Maori data sovereignty that are meant to guide um, and serve as um, the foundational um, frameworks for implementing indigenous data governance within our systems. So in, in response to the increased generation and use of data and open data, big data, open science and research environments, then limited opportunities for indigenous control, a network of indigenous scholars led the foundational research, the drafting of and the open commenting and editing, and finally, the finalization of the care principles for indigenous data governance. In 2019, the Global Indigenous Data Alliance, or GITA, released the care principles, which are collective benefit, authority to control, responsibility, and ethics, and their sub-principles. So these principles are set forth critical considerations for non-tribal data creators, stewards, and users, and are designed to guide the inclusion of indigenous peoples in data governance and increase their access to data. The care principles shift the focus of data governance from consultation to values-based relationships and have been widely recognized as enriching the discussion of collective rights to data for other populations as well. The care principles bring a people and purpose orientation to data governance, which complements the data-centric nature of the popular FAIR principles, which are findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. The FAIR principles seek to increase data sharing. Implementation of the care and fair principles together should be seen as necessary to allow indigenous peoples to govern access and use their data and to share their data on their own terms. We are concerned about implementing fair and care on already existing data, as well as instituting policies and practices to operationalize fair and care and the ongoing creation of new data that incorporates indigenous knowledge. Some of the tools to make this a reality include indigenous people's own laws, policies, and practice, and investing in indigenous data systems. Updating other governments and institutions' policies and practices is another necessary step toward ethical inclusion of indigenous knowledge in external data systems. And these updates must be grounded within indigenous peoples and nations and communities' own expectations. So setting formal standards, building capacity, creating legal and practical tools, policy, and, and research and engagement practices must align with the expectations set by indigenous peoples themselves. So really the goal is to create law, policy, ethics, and infrastructure that support indigenous rights to indigenous data throughout the data life cycle and across the data ecosystem. And to strengthen such rights by making changes, even minimal at first, across data actors such as research institutions, repositories, publishers, funders, and more. However, currently the vast majority of indigenous data ranging from ethnographic material to biological materials to earth observations and so on are neither care nor fair. Indigenous collections and data can be hard to find. They can be buried in larger collections, data sets, repositories or researcher possessions. Indigenous data are often mislabeled. They do not indicate the indigenous peoples who are related to those data and are, are not searchable. Indigenous peoples largely are not the legal rights holders. Thus, indigenous collections and data are not fair and do not perpetuate indigenous provenance, protocols for use and sharing or permissions. So we're really concerned about implementing fair and care on these already existing data sets, as well as instituting policy and practices to ensure that the plethora of new data created every day adhere to both. Now we'll move over to Talia, who will speak to some of the advances and opportunities around implementing indigenous data governance. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Carroll. Okay, so now that we move forward, uh, we want to talk about within research institutions, what are the some of what are some of the practices, tools, and recommendations that are available that move away from extractive uh, colonial data practices and reconfigure power relationships to put indigenous data in indigenous hands. Uh, as we move into discussing some of these institutional and organizational tools and recommendations that relate to Indigenous data, it's important to acknowledge that there's no singular approach. So given that CGIAR is working on a global scale and is comprised of many research centers, considerations must be given locally to respect differences among Indigenous communities. 
But with that in mind, we're hoping to highlight some key recommendations for enhancing data governance policies and for incorporating more equitable and just frameworks into the development and management of large data repositories like CGIAR's uh, big platform for data on agriculture. I also want to acknowledge that the recommendations we make here are grounded in and promote frameworks from Indigenous scholars. Okay, so all of the recommendations we identify here are centered around the broader theme of building the care principles into the development of data policy and platforms. So a few of the ways in which we'll talk about this are specifically by one, enriching metadata, um, two, recognizing indigenous intellectual property through appropriate authorship and acknowledgement, three, protecting both personal and community identifiable information, four, formalizing voluntary guidelines, and then five, the last one is tracking data use and reuse. Okay, and so I'll talk a bit more about each of these in detail, how they link to the care principles and possible avenues for incorporating them into practice. And so this first one we wanna talk about today is through enriching existing metadata. And as uh, Dr. Carroll previously mentioned, Indigenous data is often buried in larger repositories and it can be challenging to identify and locate it. And so an important first step is making Indigenous data fair by acknowledging the amount of Indigenous knowledge that is stored on uh, data repositories and platforms. One way this can be done is through the use of traditional knowledge labels, biocultural labels and notices from the local context hub. And so the local context labels and notices were developed in partnership with Indigenous communities globally to enhance Indigenous data governance and also to establish the conditions for sharing um, and reuse of Indigenous knowledge and intellectual property in digital spaces. And so while the uh, traditional knowledge and biocultural labels are a really collaborative process and take a lot of time to develop, a first step for an institution like CGIAR could be to incorporate the notices into their data repositories. And so the notices can be used by institutions and researchers to recognize indigenous contributions and data in a repository. There are currently four notices, the biocultural notice, traditional knowledge notice, attribution incomplete, and open to collaborate notices. And so, for example, the traditional knowledge notice signifies that the data set includes place-based knowledge that may require permission for future use. The biocultural knowledge, or sorry, biocultural notice also highlights that indigenous people have rights to determine the permissions for future use, but is focusing on biodiversity and genetic resources. And so these notices are really meant to be placeholders until the labels uh, can be incorporated into a repository. Um, the attribution incomplete is another important notice for large data repositories because it recognizes that the metadata for data sets is incomplete, missing, or incorrect. And so this notice could be used to show that uh, attribution to communities and the provenance of data is missing. And then lastly, the open to collaborate notice shows that an institution is willing um, and committed to improving collaboration and partnerships in relation to indigenous data. And so if CGIR is committed to this, that would be an appropriate uh, notice to include. Um, so the labels go beyond the notices in terms of collaboration. Here I'm showing you the traditional knowledge labels. Uh, they support communities in determining conditions for sharing data and the future use of data that are consistent with community governance protocols and standards. And so on a data platform, the labels provide relevant knowledge related to the access and use of indigenous data that's stored outside of community contexts. And they can be customized and are currently broken down into three main categories, provenance, protocols, and permissions. And these labels could be incorporated into the metadata of CJIAR's um, data sets, just as the FAIR ratings are, but would require collaboration with the knowledge holders of the data in order to determine the most appropriate labels, as well as any relevant customizations. And so in relation to the care principles, the incorporation of these labels would support both increased authority over data and improved ethics policies surrounding data by better respecting local protocols and permissions as determined by communities. Uh, so another related and important piece of promoting indigenous data governance governance is related to attribution and authorship. 
Um, often individual researchers and groups from outside communities are the ones credited for and cited in, rela in relation to indigenous or local knowledge. And that's because their names are associated with data sets, publications, and research findings. Uh, these groups often don't have the same responsibilities to communities and may not be accountable to knowledge holders when sharing that data with third parties. Um, at the same time, it's important to acknowledge that communities may have different needs and perspectives um, related to authorship. So some may want to restrict community level identifiers, which would include authorship in some cases, and others may want to be acknowledged for their contributions, in which case authorship is an important consideration. So an example of this is that some academic journals are including statements that ultimately affect whether a publication is considered or not. So a similar statement could be developed for data sets and whether or not they should be included in um, data repositories. So this is an example from uh, the Global Health Action Journal author guidelines, and you can see that it says manuscripts may be re rejected directly if the study uses primary data that were collected by local researchers in lower middle income countries, but those researchers are not included as, as co-authors. And so tags like this one in the metadata information would help recognize if local authors are included in existing data sets and then could also be made a requirement for uh, depositing researchers to address. Uh, data repositories have a responsibility to ensure uh, that researchers and groups are engaging in stronger partnerships. So the next one is protecting both personal and community identifiable information. So traditionally, the protection of human subjects through institutional review boards has focused on the individual level. However, that focus is embedded in Western and colonial values centered around individualism and really fails to account for indigenous values and community centered perspectives. And so a sole focus on personally identifiable information really fails to fully identify the potential potential risks and harms of research and how those risks could affect uh, future generations, for example. So by considering community level protections, it can better address the goals of reducing harm and increasing justice and respect. Uh, it can also help prevent harmful misrepresentations, generalizations, or the exploitation of communities. So ways forward for this recommendation include meeting with community leaders, tribal review bodies, elders, and anyone else who is responsible for decision making within a community. And so here I'm showing you a framework um, from Parker et al. for developing and sustaining ethical relationships. Um, and it's based on collaboration with Indigenous communities and includes um, obtaining community approval as one of the main tenets. And so um, care should be taken to consult and collaborate with communities going forward to establish guidelines that identify the types of data that should have restricted access. For example, uh, this could mean restricting access to a community level identifier like the tribe's name in a data set or publication. And so when thinking specifically about big data, about the big data platform at CGIAR, I found a, a personally identifiable information engine on the website that looked like it was being developed to help researchers identify PII information in their data. And so expanding this kind of an engine to uh, search for community identifiable information would be beneficial to address this recommendation uh, in order to protect community names, locations, or um, anything else that is desired by communities. Uh, the responsible data guidelines could also be expanded to include a greater focus on community. Um, in doing so, the research would fully, more fully account for community benefits and risks uh, to participating in research. And so the responsible data guidelines also relate to our next recommendation, which is to formalize voluntary guidelines around research ethics and data govern governance. And while it's an important step that CGIAR has outlined guidelines for depositing re researchers to their databases, it's important to be go beyond the voluntary and aspirational guidelines. Uh, formalizing these processes as part of large data repositories is a key piece of increasing uh, account accountability, not only for the researchers, but also for the organization as a whole, and also uh, to increase collective benefit, responsibility, and ethics in relation to the care principles.
So here we're showing how some other institutions are think of, thinking about this. So this is from the Earth Science Information Partners and their goals for imp implementing uh, fair and care principles that relate to formalizing better ethics and practice. So you can see that the first one is understanding indigenous legal rights and the consequ consequences of publishing that data. Uh, their second, having transparent practices and defensible data management policies. So um, holding people accountable, same goes for the third one, ensuring that depositing researchers have done their due dil diligence. And then the fourth, engaging with intellectual property review processes to determine um, if that information uh, is appropriate for a repository. And the final recommendation we wanna make today surrounds uh, research reporting and compliance through the tracking of the use and reuse of indigenous data. And so since CGIAR centers are encouraged to measure, assess and track research outputs as part of the open access and data management implementation guidelines, part of this tracking could include creating a mechanism that identifies who and how data are accessed and used. And so with this type of tracking, it's possible to determine um, if future uses are consistent with community values and protocols, and that's a critical way to mitigate harm since data is used by third parties is even further removed from its local context. Um, and while appropriate permissions to reuse won't be fully recognized until something like the traditional knowledge or biocultural labels are included, or until community communities are given rights to grant permissions to data use and reuse in repositories, tracking is an important first step in identifying how data is being used in ways that align or don't align with um, community values and protocols. And so an example of this uh, in practice would involve, could involve um, data access review committees who evaluate whether a project aligns with informed prior consent before granting uh, data access. And so ideally these um, committees would be in indigenous led. Okay, and so while we recognize that this list of recommendations is definitely not exhaustive, um, we wanted to recognize the, the many organizations and groups that are currently promoting and developing indigenous data governance and grounding uh, data management and practice in the care principles. So just to name a few, there's IATSIS, GIDA, the Climate Science Alliance, Local Context, and also the US uh, Indigenous Data Sovereignty Network. And so that's all, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Stephanie and, and Talia for your presentations. Uh, so we are now at our um, question and answer session. I can see that Francisco, you have some questions. Thank Go ahead. you. Okay. I have two questions. All right, question number one. The word co-creation of knowledge has been present much often recently. Assuming that you are familiar with it, A, how do you understand the concept of co-creation of knowledge? B, how is it articulated to care, fair, the uh, ideas that you presented here? Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for having us here. Uh, so, uh, Francisco, thank you for the question. I think, you know, um, I want to preface this by saying it's not necessarily how I understand the concept of co-creation of knowledge, um, you know, in some of the uh, uh, academic and, and practice environments that I work in, that's a, that is something that's used and, and talked about a lot, but I know from Indigenous community um, experiences that sometimes that's just not what a community is looking for, right? And so um, that is, um, uh, what do I want to say? The, it, it doesn't allow for community control. It can be negotiated where co-creation of knowledge is the output that's wanted between researchers or um, practitioners and, commu and indigenous communities. But I think that's part of and parcel of the care process um, and not necessarily something that is going to be a top-down um, uh, uh, statement in care. Um, and so, I mean, the bottom line of what I'm saying is that what CARE does at a high level is points you to those relationships with communities to, um, to design the, uh, and set forth the expectations for the relationship, uh, particularly around knowledge and data. 
Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, in the indigenous literature, uh, we prefer to use intercultural co-creation of knowledge, but we can talk about that later. My so, second question is- Francisco, sorry, could you yes. please just um, tell us uh, from which organization you are or just introduce yourself oh. so everyone know from where, where you are? Sure, thank you very much. Um, I am a, a professor at the Intercultural Maya University of Quintana Roo in Mexico. But I also I am also related to the uh, Indigenous Partnership for Food Sovereignty and Agrobiodiversity, which is an organization based in Rome. Uh, but basically, I am uh, in academia, and my background is uh, Maya, Yucatec Maya. And my second question is, knowing the guidelines that you mentioned in your presentation, for making sure the information collected protects indigenous communities' knowledge. How about if the researcher is an indigenous person? What adaptations can be made to the guidelines? And I'm asking this based on the uh, anecdote presented by Harris uh, regarding Coyote, which is a fictional person, experience going to the university. And I think it was Arizona, actually, where this story came out. I can uh, talk a little bit about Coyote's experience, but I am assuming that you're familiar with the work by Harry. The most important part here is that, you know, like I, I'm an indigenous person and I always, you know, I endeavor to follow this kind of um, responsibility that I have to not only my own community, but um, other indigenous communities by being present in a way that I, I come, it's, it's in a different way, right, than being a non-Indigenous person. But I, in some ways, I feel heightened respons responsibility in my own community um, to make sure that I'm following um, uh, the, the protocols and, um, and processes for doing this type of work there. Primarily because I know I'll be judged, right? And I want, and I, and I carry that strong responsibility with me to be doing this in a good way. Uh, and so I think um, one of the important parts here is that um, what we want to see happen is that the, you know, as we evolve and um, our data relationships um, as institutions, right, and as um, as researchers with indigenous communities and other communities, is that we want to see more um, uh, more development of of ways of being responsible to community permissions um, protocols practices around data and figuring out how to how to represent those um, as we scale up and. Um, the responsibility there is not only to be engaging with indigenous communities and local communities, but it is also to be engaging with indigenous um, leadership, indigenous scholars, and making sure these people are um, accessed for their expertise as well. Um, what we often, what we've experienced here in the U.S. a lot is that um, you know, you don't have a, for instance, in genomics research, we have a lot of indigenous genomic scientists, um, but they are not often at the table um, for discussions within our national um, the sphere, our sphere around genomics research. Thank you. So the next uh, question is from Maria Garuccio. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Maria Garuccio, and um, I'm an information management at the Alliance of Biodiversity International in SEAT. Thank you very much for the presentation. I found it extremely interesting, and I particularly enjoyed the, the section with regards to the concept of attribution. And in fact, my question is, um, essentially, if you could please share examples of perhaps workflows or best practices that are already in place in institutions or universities where they are trying to uh, provide attribution to indigenous authors and data providers. Uh, I think for me, being quite a pragmatic type of person, it'd be interesting to learn what others have done so far and uh, use that as a starting point, perhaps. Thank you. Thanks for that question. So I think, um, you know, there, there has, so the labels and, and the notices that Talia presented have been around for about a decade now. Oh, okay. um, and, and those have been used 
Um, until, until more recently, those have been used primarily on indigenous only collections um, and within kind of the, um, the art and physical object world, right? Um, and what we're beginning to see is uh, those applied to more broad collections. So for instance, um, at the University of Tasmania, they, they are beginning to implement those across um, their, all of their holdings. So like in, in their uh, research repository. And um, so you've seen, so they're, they've, they now use those labels on many, many, many of their websites um, that are repositories and collections. Um, they haven't, they use the notices. They haven't um, actively started putting the labels into practice. They're in that process now. Okay. Simon Fraser University um, in, in Canada um, also has started doing that. Um, Geome, um, which is a, a, a genetics um, uh, repository, has started using the notices as well. But you know, this is a very rapidly changing environment. Some of the other practices that we're beginning to see um, are uh, kind of still high level, right? So we're beginning to see repositories of various types start to make statements around um, adhering to either the care principles or promoting indigenous data sovereignty in some way. Um, open, uh, open to EK there in Barcelona um, is doing that. They have a data sovereignty statement um, for theirs. And then, um, uh, and then you, then the next step is, for instance, like our university here that I'm at, uh, for our research data repository, the deposit slip and the guidelines um, both require you to indicate that you have indigenous data, and if you have indigenous data, you have to provide proof of permission um, and an attribution statement for it. Um, and that gets reviewed. Um, so we've already had processes where there's things that we need to look at and decide what to do about this or educate people. Um, and so it is a rapidly um, changing environment. Um, and one of the hardest parts, I think, is that a lot of the um, the process, uh, a lot of the content can't. Um, I'd say about 50-50. Some of the content you can take and use, right? But a lot of the underlying issues have to be addressed before you begin to use it. So some of the some of the um, major reasons why people um, and institutions don't implement, for instance, notices is you have to be able to admit that you you have large holdings <laughs> that were collected um, in colonial ways, right? That um, might not um, really affect indigenous peoples and local communities. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. I was just wondering, uh, just quickly, uh, a follow up question. Uh, a lot of these institutions that you uh, mentioned, like the University of Tasmania, the university where you're at as well, uh, is there a sort of like a community of practice around uh, these best practices? Like, do you dialogue amongst yourselves? Do you have meetings, etc? I was just wondering if that's maybe a, an area that we could delve into. Yeah, so um, we have had some meetings um, and um, for instance, I've participated some in our, like in the open repositories world and that kind of stuff uh -huh. um, where I'm actively talking with a funder to try to get some funding to put like a postdoc to be able to coordinate that um, because I think it's really important. Nice. Um, so there's a, there is a community of practice around like museums, but there's not one around repositories yet. Okay. Um, there is work coming out of, and Talia presented on the work of um, Earth Science Information Partners. And so what they're doing um, is creating guidelines around trust, fair, and care um, mm -hmm. for repositories. And um, those are ever evolving. They're, we're kind of near the end of, um, of kind of the, the real work piece of it. And they've started presenting on it. That's where that slide that Talia presented came from. Um, but their work is really good too, I think for general repositories, not just earth science ones. Um, and so that will be helpful too and we could get that out. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, so Elizabeth uh, Arnaud, raise your hand. I'm Elizabeth Arnaud. I work at the Alliance Biodiversity Seattle in the CGIR and I'm leading the ontology community of practice. Uh, thank you very much for this very interesting presentation that opens a lot of uh, options for being more, uh, making our data more ethical. 
My question was uh, related to the biocultural notice among the labels that were mentioned. And I wanted to know what are your connections or your discussions with the, the genetic resources treaty and then regarding the data in the context of the Nagoya protocol you have exchanged. Is there any discussion around how to implement that for the data uh, around the genetic resources uh, and the treaty? Yeah, so I've written with some of some um, uh, indigenous genomics um, scientists around some of that work. Um, there's also an active group trying to figure out too around the DSI issues um, that are kind of out ahead. Um, right now, so the digital sequence um, work that's going on. And so there is, um, I'll pop into the chat some of the um, uh, some of the, the publications and authors you should look at for that type of work, particularly. Yeah, thank you, because we, we started uh, to be part of the discussion regarding DSI, what is the meaning exactly of a digital sequence information and how to track that from the lab to the to the farm. So I would be interested to read that. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. This is helpful too, because I know um, I participated in something to create a white paper around some of that and we haven't gotten it out yet. So oh. there's definitely interest in it. So thank you. Thank you. And my second question was, um, if we want to, to engage uh, with the data assessors like Talia mentioned from those uh, from the indigenous uh, communities, uh, how do we reach them? Who, who can help us making sure at least we have some um, contact with those assessors, making sure our data are complying with the PR principle at least? Yeah, I think so. That's like the tricky piece at, at right now. I think part of the, the complexities is, is that if you're going to especially um, backtrack and, and address um, already existing data, there's a lot of um, resource that's required to do that, right? From not only the institution who's holding the data, but also the communities uh, who might have relationships with those data. And so some of that is backtracking and um, going back and working, figuring out who, what those communities are. Um, and um, like you said, trying to make those connections. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and the flip side of that is like, how do you make sure that you have policies and practices in place so that moving forward, um, you're, you're creating those relationships as you, as you create and the data relationship yourself, yeah. um, which is, um, I don't wanna say easier, but it's a whole different type of work to do. Mm -hmm. um, the backtracking stuff, I think the most important piece there is like some communities um, have a plethora of data out there, right? And so for them, it's, it's, it's trying to figure out what are the data that they are most sensitive, that they most wanna make sure to have a relationship with right now um, and deciding where to move forward. Um, with that. And so the data you might have might be something they really want to make sure to make that relationship with, or it might be lower tier. Um, and so that's kind of one of the more difficult pieces. Yeah. Okay. And my last point before I give the floor to Meda. Um, uh, some of our colleagues, they do invite uh, the farmers they interview being a co authors, at least of a data paper or a peer review paper. So is there any, any guidelines or recommendation? Uh, is, is it something that the, the care principle leads to, in fact, or is recommended to, to keep uh, uh, the community we, we survey or we, we interact with as co-authors to, to publications? Yeah, so that is one of the things um, that is suggested kind of as a low bar. And for instance, if you look here um, at um, in the US, our, some, some of our indigenous communities have like research review boards and um, that address some of these issues around um, requirements for either publications review or co-authorship. Um, and so you see that coming out, of, out as a strong piece um, and um, but obviously not all the time, you know, that people sometimes will defer and say, no, no, we don't, you know, we don't have the time. Mm -hmm. um, but increasingly so, I think um, 
it, what that means is that we, as, as authors and, and as academic authors, we have to begin to shift how we think about um, what the, how we value contributions, right? So like, if you look at a lot of the author um, contribution requirements for different types of journals, sometimes, you know, they don't even include something like who contrib contributes knowledge, right? From, a, from this kind of more um, knowledge systems perspective, um, it's all geared towards this kind of like creating um, scholarly knowledge instead of knowledge um, from extractive, you know, extractive knowledge um, perspectives from communities. And so um, as we as we move towards this, we have to shift how we think about what um, what what contributions are for um, for public for publications. Thank you. Thank you. Eric. Thank you very much. So, Meda, could you please um, just introduce yourself and, and ask your question? Sure, thank you. Um, I'm Meda Dewari, and I lead the, the organized module of CGIR's platform for big data and agriculture. And I'm also uh, straddling the, the Excellence in Agronomy initiative, which is a new initiative that's going to be collecting a fair bit of agronomic data from um, the global south, essentially. Um, the reason I just wanted to make a quick comment that kind of pertains, I think, to what you were just talking about a little bit and to what Maria was asking about earlier. Um, and that is to say that we've developed a, a publishing workflow for, you know, that makes it easy to, to or easier anyway, uh, to make data fair and, and uh, upload it to our repositories. Uh, there are a lot of nifty little um, user-friendly um, uh, bits and pieces in there, bits and pieces, <laughs> you know, a part of the workflows uh, are, are quite user-friendly. And I'm thinking from listening to this that it might be useful uh, for some group, um, uh, uh, you know, some, some group involved uh, in, in this discussion perhaps to look at Fairscribe and see whether the labels that you've talked about um, can also be incorporated in, in user-friendly ways um, uh, to, to that workflow, which will make it easier going forward at least um, to, to, to try and address, you know, to, to at least try and explore how, how we might address uh, the care principles uh, in a technical way. So this is, this is the technical end of it. Uh, the cultural piece of it is, is yet another ball of wax, but I just wanted to make that comment. Thanks. And yeah, um, I see that Gideon, uh, you have your hand raised. Hi, I'm Gideon, Gideon Kruzman. Um, I'm also part of the CGIR platform for big data and agriculture, where I lead the community of practice on, uh, on socio-economic socio data. Um, I'm um, the CGIR research center that I work for is CIMIT, and there um, uh, I chair the research ethics uh, committee, um, and I really appreciate uh, uh, this we this webinar. It's uh, it's very very timely, um, uh, but it also you know it, it it is an issue that that will take a uh, uh, is not easy uh, not easy to resolve because it is uh, as was mentioned uh, uh, a number of times. It is about culture, about you know how do you uh, how can you get people to really uh, think deeply about these things um, at every stage of the research uh, research uh, process? Um, uh, and it's not and uh, and it, it's broader than just uh, strictly speaking uh, indigenous uh, uh, indigenous peoples. Uh, you also see it where where research is being done. Uh, in uh, in some of the uh, our target uh, uh, target geographies in uh, in uh, in Asia, Latin America, and Africa, uh, where there there where there is research, where there is very little active participation of uh, of local uh, local research uh, the researchers in the in the whole uh, in the whole process. So it's um, uh, leading to for instance, publications about a specific country with no researchers from that country um, uh, in the in the co-author co-author list. I mean, you know, those are the those are clear uh, 
um, clear examples uh, that we still have a long way to go before before this uh, this is really ingrained in, in in all the work that we do. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that really um, kind of reflexive approach to what's what's going on. And and um, I think you know more broadly you bring the you bring broader points you know if we approach this and what we do from an indigenous perspective is because is a both indigenous and human rights kind of framework for this work um but more broadly it, both the practices um and the policies are applicable to work even i mean I, even within um for instance like com, um urban communities um and you, you named some others as well and so there's there's broad application and i like to think about it too as um, not only changing practice, but once you um, begin to have these conversations, like you said, within our institutions, you create the space within the institution itself. Um, and I, by space, I mean not only um, space for policy, space for discussion, space for practice changes, but also space within cyber infrastructure. And that's one of the things that people um, as you pointed out, it's kind of this backdoor discussion a lot of times instead of having the discussion up front and throughout the process of practice, right? So that it's guiding how you create and how you design um, infrastructure um, and how you create space, for instance, for, um, um, for metadata um, and what space you create and how what you require. Um, and that's just one example, but this is a really, really important point. So thank you. Thank you very much, Stephanie and Gideon. I'd like to make a comment. I think it is important at this point of the discussion. Now that we are recognizing the importance of indigenous knowledge, we also should recognize the importance of the ways from which that knowledge was created. Because we can tap all the knowledge that is out there, but that knowledge was created in, in, in a way that we also have to understand and to encourage. Otherwise, we're going to run out of, uh, uh, of the wisdom that is behind uh, indigenous knowledge. That was my comment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francesco. Thank you for this last comment. Well, today we are at the end of the Q&A sessions. Thank you so much, Stephanie and, and Talia for the, your presentation and also for, for answering the question. Thank you all for uh, this uh, lively discussion. I will now uh, give the floor to Elizabeth Arno to uh, close the webinar. Over to you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Celine. So indeed, thanks a lot to Stephanie and Talia. This, is, this was very... Uh, instructive for us, uh, and, and we really need to, to continue collaboration to, to try to implement the care principles in our uh, data management cycle. That's an important point to, to follow up on. Thank you very much, and uh, I wish you a nice day or evening uh, wherever you are. Bye-bye.